most people think oh, yeah. big dreams because they watch these big things on Instagram and Facebook and TikTok and but it's not realistic. So inspiring you to reach your goals and live your dream. And live your dream. This is the Keaton Nelson Show. All righty, guys. Uh, another awesome episode today for you. Uh, Tony Watley, thank you so much for being on today, man. Hey, Keaton, man, it's good to meet you. And I hope to really get to know some of your listeners and give some good value to them today, brother. Yeah, that's that's the goal. We're trying to dig it out of you. Nice to meet you, too. This is the first time we're meeting. Um, and yeah, I, you know, I'd love for you to introduce yourself to me and the listeners. What, Who are you? What do you do? I would say that the most interesting thing about my past is that I basically led a dual career where I was equally driven in a corporate world where I have an engineering degree and I was working in management and big oil, oil and gas for about 20 years, multiple six figure earner ex- going on executive path. <laughs> and my other passion was always cars and building and racing cars. So I built these businesses really as a, to fund my hobby. You know, I built these things to be able to be able to afford nicer cars or modify cars or give myself excuses to ride off going to the racetrack and things like that. And, you know, this side business that I created was ls1tech.com, which was the largest General Motors performance community on the internet, even still to this day. Had 100, 300,000 registered members and you know, multiple six-figure profit makers. So I was making about 400,000 a year on the side with this business, these websites that I'd created. And had 150 advertisers, a lot of different things, advertising revenue, big traffic, had 100,000 unique visitors per day. And wow. so... You know, that became like the basis of my book, which was called Side Hustle Millionaire, because I literally built and sold companies for millions of dollars that I just built on the side. That's sweet, man. Would you, you sold that business that you just talked about? I sold that one to a private equity company in 2007 and after yeah. 2009 transition there and, you know, went on to start other companies. Can you, is it uh, disclosable? Yeah, Deviate Motoring was the retail end of that. That's another company I've had since 2007. Basically, I carved out the retail portion of the first community, and that's a online wheels and, and high-end forged wheels and, and tires and things like that. And that is also just something to keep me relevant in the automotive industry. I still like to be a part of that. The things I do now, I'm a business coach. I help other people start scale and exit companies with 365 Driven, which is the entrepreneurship community about 4200 members right now and also the podcast name is 365 driven so this is more of my legacy thing this is the thing that i like enjoy doing so over the 20 years of me being a business owner i've always given people advice and helping people start companies and even 15 people that were formerly staff members of mine have built seven and eight figure companies since then and they've always been telling me you should be teaching this full time because look at these results and and I just had a bunch of excuses not to do so because I was making money, had a comfortable life, family, yeah. job, career. I was really busy and also didn't like putting myself out there in public because I didn't have to. I had a lot of insecurities around being on stage or being on camera or just, I was very fine just being the MVP, hiding behind the logo and just doing things and making money without people knowing who I am. Totally, man. Can you, how much did you sell that company for that you sold or- we sold that one for 2.3 cash. Damn. Cash? How much did, of it did you own? 100% of that one. Woo-hoo! That's not a bad little payout. Um, was it, it was cash all up front or did, was it yep. like, a, oh man, what a, that's awesome, man. Yeah. Congratulations. Love yeah. hearing that. Thank you. Yeah, amazing. Um, and yeah, it just makes sense to go transition to teaching. I've, uh, I've started doing a little bit of that myself, but I'm like, I don't charge for it. I don't, because I make money doing my business, right? Mm-hmm. I don't need to uh, make money teaching people, but I don't, I'm finding myself like they have questions and I don't have time to answer. And, and, you know, I'm probably not providing the best you know service I could to them, even though it is free, but still you, you, I do it because I want to help. Right. I think the information that we put out there, especially with podcasts or YouTube or the books or you know, these are free consumable information. I think we should always give away our best secrets. Anybody that listens to my show or watches the video or the things that I create or reads the book, they're going to learn a lot of the things that I've been able to share because mm-hmm. information nowadays, especially is very easy to get to. So information is lower value. It's, it's 
what are they going to do with that information? Do they have the implementation? Do they have the accountability? Right. Do they have the coach? Do they have the mindset correctly? So give away your best information for free, which it sounds like you're doing that. But totally, if, if you're going to charge, it has to be for access and proximity. So if they want your time, then there's a value to that. And that's what totally. I'm mean coaching. Yeah, I'm, just, I'm not ready for it yet, to be honest. I'm, my business is growing like crazy and I'm mm-hmm. just in the weeds with it right now. But yeah. Um, yeah, and I'm enjoying every minute of it. Um, we just went from a six-person team to a 20-person team in two weeks. Good Lord. Yeah. Good Lord. <laughs> uh, systems and processes, systems and processes. That's it. Mm-hmm. But um, I would love to dig into a couple things with you. Um, I would love to talk about this community that you built. I think that's impressive, mm-hmm. right? Uh, if someone's looking to build their own community, something like that, whether it's a Facebook group, a website, people that have traffic go and visit it all the time. I'm guessing you had events and how does, how do those events play into it? Or maybe you didn't, I, I'd love to just get your insights and how you made that a success and how you advise someone else to do the same. You know, the funny thing about our successes in life is that most people don't even remember your second, third, fourth, fifth place attempts at things. Mm-hmm. You know, and I say that because a lot of times people see the highlight reel, basically, of what you've accomplished in your life. Sure. And, you know, they'll recognize you as like, you're the co-founder or founder of this, right? And, you know, think about this, like a big example that everybody knows is like Elon Musk. You know, he, he, he was the co-founder of PayPal. Like, that's a pretty big company. He made like- No one remembers dollars. it. Yeah. Nobody I, remembers. They just think about him as Tesla and like all these different things that he's doing now. But, you know, that was a big company on its own. hundred million, I think he left on that. Enormous. So I say that because I want people to understand that maybe you're built a business right now that you're not really, you know, cash flowing, you're not really doing so well. And you're, that's just the beginning. It's a stepping stone. You're learning some things, you're making mistakes. Cool. Like you're going to take those lessons with you into the next businesses and the next joint ventures and things that you get into. Mm-hmm. And the, where I'm rolling up with this is like the second largest community that I built it could be a standalone on its own. It grew to 280,000 registered members. It's called performancetrucks.net. It's literally the same business model that we had built once we established that and had all the contacts with the advertising and the revenue and the events, like you said, mm-hmm. was that, hey, we're going to go do a truck version of this. Like, would you guys like to be involved in that one too? And they're like, yeah, you guys run this really like a good business. We're getting a good ROI. You're fair with your rates. You always keep your server, you know, speeds up. You you, you interact with the, the, the customers and the users and you know, like, hell yeah, we'll go join that. So day one, that was a cash flowing second operational business that grew nearly to the same size. But most people don't even know about that site. See what I mean? It's like, yeah, I yeah. I founded performancetrucks.net, 280,000 registered wild. members, seven figure business. And people would be like, oh, cool. Like, yeah, but how awesome. did you do that? I mean, like, I know the second one, you kind of probably pulled from the first, but like, that's it. How, how did you build the first one? The first one, I never intended to make millions of dollars from i no, did it totally it was, i enjoyed the community i was a member of another website that was active at the time and they weren't running it properly they were basically not paying their server bills and sometimes we'd log in and the things would be hard deleted and all this content that we were creating like all the how-to articles and the videos and you know magazine features and things that we were writing you know basically free the person wasn't being a good steward of that information and we'd log in, it would be gone. And after that happened a couple of times, we approached them and said, Hey guys, you know, why don't you pay your bills? You have advertisers. We know what a server costs, right? Like you're, you're clearly making a profit. And instead of taking that as constructive advice from some of their best supporters and their contributors, they said, well, you know, if you think you could do a better job, you should go start your own website. <laughs> and so Little do they know, I knew how to code websites. I'd been, that was my first side hustle. I was building these little rudimentary one to three web pages for these businesses and you know car things. And I said, well, shit, I can go buy a software license and rent a server and upload it and click all the channels and the boxes and hire a security person to figure out the exploitation. And I, all I can just learn all this stuff. And, and that's what I did. And you know, being a reputation of someone who was already contributing, it made it very easy for people to go, Hey, Tony's going to go over there. Let's go see what he's doing. Like he's always helping out over here. Let's go see what he's doing at this new website. And Mm. you know, the people that were interested in the technical and the racing, most of them came over because that was what I was focused in. It was like technical and the racing. I didn't care about the socializing and the drama and the memes and like the sharing, like the social aspects, like 
that was the owner of the other website. He was more focused on the social aspects. I wanted the technical side. And so it became a very good division on that. And within one year, we became number one in that market. And they never caught us when we, we, we still like the people that bought the website, they're still number one in that niche. So mm. how do you grow that? Well, to me, content creation and understanding that a community, even as a community leader is not about you. It's not about your ego. It's not about standing on the top of the pyramid and pounding your chest and going, I'm super awesome. And you're here just for me. Cause that's, mm. that's very common and prevalent to what we see nowadays with Instagram and YouTubers. We, we understand that there's a follower business model and there's a community business model and they're not the same mm. a followership. You have to think about as lines of communication. A followership is basically me preaching to you and it's one way conversation and it's between me and each of my individual listeners or audience. Yeah. There's no two way conversations there. So that's a follower business model and it can work. People can make a lot of money doing that. Sure. Community business model is a lot different. A community is not about the person at the top of the pyramid. It's about the person at the top of the pyramid facilitating connections between the members of the community. So if you and someone else were a member of my community, I would like for you two to become best friends. Even if I'm not in that triangle, I just want you sure. two to become best friends. Yeah. Because I want you guys to keep coming back to my digital virtual bar, so to speak, because that's where your friends are hanging out. So I'm the bar owner, but I don't have to be best friends with you. And you don't, you're not there because of me. You're there because of the bar and all the value that you're getting in the drinks. And, you know, we don't, we don't go to nightclubs because of the owner, right? We don't go to restaurants because of the owner. We go there for the food and the atmosphere and hanging out with people we know or seeing our favorite bartender, right? Yeah. So that's the community aspect. Build that. Then how do you do that? You just create the value that they keep coming back for their admission price, right? So my membership groups are free and people go, well, you know, why don't you charge for that? Why don't you monetize? Like you can, you can monetize indirectly from that. Those can be your customer pool, right? Those mm -hmm. can be people that help you launch your book to indirectly monetize it. Those are the people that can listen to your podcast. Those are the people that can refer their friends to grow your audience and your community. So if you get into this transactional relationship and you're focused too much on trying to make maximum dollars per person, you're going to squash the long-term lifetime value of the audience, right? To me, I'm, I'm looking for lifetime value. I want these people to be in my space for 20, 30 years versus trying to just make a maximum transaction one time on them and then just showing them the door. Mm -hmm. Cool. I love that. Um, now, I, I could go two ways with this um i'll let you pick how <laughs> pick your own journey here this is kind of fun um i, I know that you have an, a best-selling book on amazon i'd love to learn about how you marketed that um or i'd like to uh ask the question is yeah it's great that you want to um you know get the most out of your lifetime value of people but what about the people who are starting business with no money and they need cash fast because they just did. What would you say? To, so you can either answer both or you can choose one and we can go down. A yeah, let's, let's, stick, let's stick with the business one for now because it's, cool. it's more relatable to a larger audience. To me, I think that the hard question to ask as a business owner or someone that wants to start a business is are, what are you willing to do to ensure the success of that business? Real simple question, right? What are you willing to do? What are you willing to invest? What are you willing to put in? Whether that's set sweat equity or in investments or doing things and not outside of the realm of that is, would you be willing to get a job to be able to fund that dream? And mm -hmm. you'll find that nowadays, especially on Instagram, there's a lot of people that have a big ego and they're like, well, I want to be an entrepreneur. Like I'm never going to go work for somebody else. Cause it's cool to say that. And I agree. I completely agree with them that it is cool to say that. And it's cool to be that. But the thing is you may not be ready for that. And what are you willing to do also includes, are you willing to get a job to be able to fund that? Because, you know, my book is called Side Hustle Millionaire. I mean, you literally just hold, I just told you a story how I made millions of dollars with this side businesses that I've created. I had a full-time job at the time, you know, and people ask, well, why didn't you quit your full-time job and go all in? It's because I was number one in my market share. I built the processes, the systems, and the people in place that I didn't have to be present to make that money. 
you know, it's kind of like you talked about the processes and systems when we kicked off the show here. Yeah, you need. If it. you have solid processes and systems, which I learned in engineering and corporate, because that was an oil company. That's what we do. We yes, have processes absolutely. on processes and we have way too many systems and we have risk mitigations and this crazy levels of these things. And you know, what happens if this fails? Well, well this is the next process. Like we had it's, everything. Yeah. So, it's I awesome. learned that stuff. I learned yeah. that from corporate. I said, well, yeah. if I can build a business where I can travel around the world or sometimes I'm working offshore, I'm in Africa or France in different time zones. I can't be physically somewhere to manage the day-to-day operations. So therefore, let me just create these processes and systems to do that, hire the right people to manage that, and I don't have to be there anymore. So it, it's mm-hmm. it can be done, right? So what are you willing to do? Are you willing to go get the job? Even if you're pushing a broom or digging a ditch, like I've done both of those kind of things. Like, are you willing yeah. to do it? And if the answer is no, then the dream isn't big enough. Like you're not, mm-hmm. you're not as driven or, you know, you're not really motivated as that you think you are. Cause a lot of times people talk, just talk, 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 talk. And I, I have no problem seeing people going to get a job to be able to fund what they want to really do. I mean, that's, that's what are you willing to do? Right. <laughs> well, I mean, I think people should get a job they should have a source of income period correct yeah, right you know what i mean agreed um, yeah because i don't i don't the money thing it's a it's a big excuse when you say i don't have money to start a company that's the biggest yeah. excuse there is and it's very common yeah i you took know, 27 dollars my when i had 31 bucks in my bank account and went dude, and passed out. dude it's uh yeah the excuse is so common but here here's the problem with this okay if someone were to say, hey, Tony, what is a dream business that you would love to own? I said, man, I would love to have a Ferrari dealership on a racetrack. Like, I would love to have a road course in the mountains with a lake and a Ferrari dealership in the front that I can, you know, have my friends come over. We can go drive on the track and we can just take the new cars out and I can own a bunch of Ferraris. Like, that'd be pretty cool. But financially, <laughs> like, like start doing numbers in your head. Like, what does that look like, dude? You could probably have to be like a 150 to 300 millionaire. Like you have to have yeah. that kind of money to even start something like that. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't have that. So I don't, does that mean I give up? Does that mean I just don't do anything because my dream is too big for me to financially, like that's how most people think, right? They right. go, Hey, I want to start this company. I'm going to make $10 million, but I don't have a thousand dollars. Like, well, then that's not a realistic goal for you right now. So here's what you should do. Maybe you should go get that job to be able to fund the small business, learn some things that the small business grew that to a mid six figure type income, build something to a seven figure revenue, eight figure revenue. Like these are steps and it may not even be the same company through all these steps. Cause I always think about this. I call them staircase businesses where I can't afford the Ferrari dealership, but maybe I can afford this one. And maybe I can build that one and sell it. And then I can get to the next one. Then I can do this and repeat that process. And eventually maybe I will have, the Ferrari dealership on the racetrack. But see what I mean? Like most people think oh, yeah. big dreams because they watch these big things on Instagram and Facebook and TikTok and, but it's not realistic. So go do what's realistic for you now and quit making excuses. Hmm. Interesting. Um, I, I have like uh, contradicting views. I think people should go big and everything, but uh, maybe if I look back at my life, I was probably more practical than I want to admit. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I was waiting tables when I started my business and, and was paying my bills that way, um, yeah. making about a thousand bucks a week or whatever, mm-hmm. uh, waiting tables. So, um, yeah. And then I, once I replaced that income, then I quit and went all in. You're right. But, but yeah, um, I wish I started from scratch thinking like, how could I get this business to run from day one without me? Mm-hmm. Um, that's one thing I wish I, I did. Um, and yeah, it would have made a huge difference. I run into people who do have nice jobs. They got tech jobs or maybe they're coding for other people and they're making, you know, uh, let's say mid six figures a year. Mm-hmm. And they think they can go start a business because they've got some, you know, they probably don't even know how to spend their mid six figure income. You know what I mean? And so they, they're like, Oh, I could start a business. They start dumping money on Facebook ads, hiring companies and all those different things. And their stuff's not selling. And then they're sitting there wondering why, what's the difference between what you did versus what they're doing? Yeah. I would say that's one of the biggest mistakes we see for people leaving the corporate workforce and getting into business ownership is they, they highly value their knowledge or their skill set, And they think that that's going to be the reason that they're going to be successful as a business owner. And what we find now is that 
whatever you think that you're the guru at knowledge wise or the skill level, like if you're working with your hands or you're an artist or a designer or a coder, or whatever, like whatever you think that your value is to corporate is only worth about 50% of your business success as an entrepreneur. And that's really like hard for people to stomach and ego because they're, maybe they're really good and really highly compensated at what they do. But when they go start a business, then they fall on their face. They don't, they don't realize why it's because they have not invested the time and the money in learning business. They don't understand that yeah. until you have employees to do the best parts of all the aspects of the company, whether that's accounting, the marketing, the HR, the leadership, like the visionary stuff. Maybe you're not a visionary, like right? maybe you're just an operations person, right? So all these things that they kind of discredit or discount or just disregard in their corporate life, they don't realize that they have to do all that in order to be a successful business. Yeah, you do. So let's say that you're a brilliant music producer. Well, you know what? That's only 50% of your success. You have to go be equally good at learning. I think it's way less than 50%. You know, I'm just being nice. Like you had to be like yeah. equally good at business principles to even have a shot at being successful. And, and that's where I come in. Like I help people to understand business principles. Mm. Yeah. I, I, I went to school for music. It's funny you bring that up. I went to school for music and then um, I waited tables and I ended up trying different businesses and failing back to back to back, but kept trying. Then one, one actually worked. Right. Um, and then I was thinking back, like if I knew all the things I knew, like if know all the things I know now, then with music, I'd probably be able to make a substantial living yeah. off of music. You know, I just didn't know how to market. I didn't know how to brand. I didn't know how to uh, productize what I was doing. I didn't know how to price, you know, different services I was offering and, and ways to do that. And it probably would not be that difficult to make a six figure income as a musician if I knew what I knew now. Um, you know, just as like a solo preneur type of thing, but I couldn't break probably 10 K a year off of music when I was doing that, you know? Well, yeah. Um, I mean, you and I both know just in that field alone, there's so many musicians that are questionable talent wise, but they're brilliant at marketing and they're making a fortune just from their marketing and their social media, but they're really not that good at singing and they're not really a good. Music <laughs> I mean, let's yeah. be real. Marketing has more value than talent. a lot of times it sure does. It sure does without a doubt um and then branding as far as like comes down to looks it comes down to yep. how they dress and what you know colors they use all sorts of different things but mm -hmm. um yeah super interesting so 365 driven mm -hmm. um what are you um what are you you said you're helping with business principles what how would you you know break those up and the four pillars of my show are wealth, health, relationships, and mindset. So those are the four things we really focus on. Can you say that slower again? I'm sorry. If I didn't catch yeah. it, my listeners probably didn't either. Yeah. Wealth, health, mindset, relationships. Okay. Do those go into any sub pillars or anything like that? Well, not really because no. everybody's got different needs. And I'll think even from a coaching client perspectives. Sure. Some people have their strengths and weaknesses. We don't always focus on weaknesses, but we do look at the things that are causing them kind of a distraction or stress in their lives, right? Because mm -hmm. a lot of times I would say my ideal one-on-one -on -one type coaching client is usually the seven and eight figure revenue business owner who works too much and is stressed out and maybe has let themselves go physically. And maybe their family's, their family life's not really happy because they're always at the office or always at the shop, right? Yeah. And so they've check the box on the financials, but everything else in their life is just this chaos. And, you know, these are the kind of people that sometimes will look 10 years older than they really are because they're just overworked and they just kind of take on too much. They haven't learned how to say no. They haven't created boundaries. They're not focusing on their health because they have that excuse like, oh, I'm just always at the office and I can never get back in shape. And like, right. so it's all the common excuses. So what we do, we start to break down what are your daily tasks? What are your weekly tasks, your monthly tasks? Like what are the ones that we should be delegating, right? A lot of people don't delegate. They, they, they think that they're the only ones that can do that. And they think that, you know, if they want it done right, they got to do it themselves. And I hope some listeners listen to this go, damn it, that's me. Cause this is very common. It's not uncommon to say those kind of things. But the thing is, is that maybe you're doing administrative work where you could be paying somebody 15, $20 an hour, even in your office to go do that. When you should be a CEO and operating in that $200, $300 an hour, thousand dollar an hour stuff. Like, you know, like, so what happens is you're, you're the highest paid administrative worker 
that's not really good at it, not really motivated to do the work. So you're actually one of the least effective administrators or secretaries or whatever you want to call them. That's overpaid because of what you should be earning. So when you put it in that perspective, like, oh, crap, like I'm essentially not very good at what I do. And I'm charging, you know, $200 an hour to do it. Like, this is not a good employee, right? Like you would fire yourself if that's what your your job was due. So, you know, so you start to carve back and and here's the other problems. We'll start to carve back free time. I call it time freedom. And the problem with entrepreneurs is they backfill that newfound free time with more shit to do instead of realizing like the I need to be doing the things that are important to me. Like maybe I need to go do more vacations or spend more time or have a hobby or, you know, work on my family life or my fitness. They, they, they automate something with their business and then they go, okay, now I could do more work. Like that's not the answer. Yeah. yeah it's connected with me at a level too. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. so true. <laughs> Dude. That's so funny. Yeah. The same these, thing with money hacks. too. I mean, think about all these automations and apps and all these things that we've created in technology. They were never intended for us to do more work. They were actually intended for us to do less work mm. and get more time. Yeah. And then we all go and find something else to do instead. I do so, the same thing with money, ironically, right? I'll get more money in my bank account and I'll be like, mm-hmm. ooh, great. Now I can go spend it on another business investment that I probably don't need. I need to figure out how to optimize other things you know, so I don't need to spend that money or, or whatever, you know? Yeah. Um, same thing with time. Actually, recently I've taken a step back and been like, all right, at least three times a week in the gym, mm-hmm. stop working at 5 PM period. Yes. Be with your leave, kids. leave your cell phone. Don't answer your phone and stuff at home. You know, that's it. Yep. Um, and we'll get to it later, uh, a little bit later on, but there's some questions I asked about regrets and, and things. And, um, you know, I had someone talk about their, their mom dying on another episode. And, um, and I'm like, I don't, it's like, that's the stuff that bothers people, you know, and that's the stuff that matters is all these relationships that you're, you're throwing away because you want to spend more time working, um, you know, and it's what's going to matter to you. You're never going to care that you spend an extra three hours to make a close of, even if it's a hundred thousand dollar million dollar deal, you're not going to care when you're on your deathbed. You're you know? not. Uh, not everybody, everybody should go read Steve Jobs, like final, you know, thoughts in his life. Ooh, you know, I haven't read it. Yeah, it's, it, you can go look up, you know, Steve, Steve Jobs, final words. And I mean, the guy's a multi-billionaire, you know, you know, Apple, right. Mm. And he's, he's really regretting like a lot of the things he did just chasing money because he realizes time is limited and even, you know, a disease he was de- you know, deteriorating at a fast pace and he just realized like all the money in the world ain't going to save him and like he wished that he would have done things a lot differently mm. yeah totally how do you find balance in your life i don't think balance is a i don't think that's a it's a it's a universal answer i think everybody has their own balance okay sure. because you know we 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 like to say life and work balance because it sounds good but mm-hmm. The truth is, is it also depends on what you're doing and what you're filling your hours of your day with. So let's say that you had a high paying career, but it wasn't something you really enjoyed. It was something that maybe something that's physically taxing or just maybe something that's mentally taxing or high stress, right? Mm-hmm. That, that may, yeah, you maybe should be able to figure out something to cut back on those things because it's causing you stress. It's causing you health issues. It's causing you family issues or just things that are negative in your life. Now, let's say that you're doing something that's fulfilling. Let's say that maybe you're helping puppies or children or whatever that checks the box that makes you joyful or happy, right? Yeah. I'm not saying chase your dreams because sometimes businesses that we create are still fulfilling and just those are the obvious type answers. So if you're working 10, 12 hours a day doing things that's fulfilling and making you happy, it's feeding you energy, that's not a bad thing. So is it the work-life balance really a factor at that point? Maybe you're actually finding more enjoyment doing that than sitting at the couch or watching TV or, you know, uh, distractions in our life. So assess like if the things that you're doing daily are bringing you energy or robbing you of energy and it's okay to do more of the stuff that brings you energy. And, and that's why I always think about like, when I hear like work-life balance, it's like, I want to spend more time doing things that feed me and energize me versus things that kind of deplete me. Mm, you have kids? I do. I have one son. He's 22. Wow. Yeah. Um, you ever wanted to, this is a 
maybe a personal question, but when there was when he was younger, you ever wanted to be at the office more than, or or be working more than you wanted to go home and, and and be with him? Yeah, absolutely. That was one of the regrets I would say that I have is I was really focused in mostly in my late twenties and most of my entire thirties. I'll be fifty this year, so it's for context. But you know, when thirty, like especially men, men and like business women, okay we have different phases of our life. And I would just say it's easiest to break down by, by our decades of our life. So when you're in your teens, you're just trying to fit in, or you're trying to like get a cute girlfriend or boyfriend and you want to be popular, or likable, right? That's kind of like a goal. Then twenties for most people that are driven or is, is about stacking education. You're either going to school or you're learning things, you're gaining new skills. And when you start to get in your later twenties, you start to applying those things and get some results. You're starting to, you know, making your salaries, you're, you're, maybe you're starting your first companies. And, and so sure. now 30, let's say 30 is the milestone where you go, you know what? I've got the experience now. I've got the education. Let, let me just stack money. Let me just go crush money for, you know, however many years. And you think that's going to be the rest of your life, the way you in that perspective. And so you make these sacrifices and you work extra hours, you pick up a second job, you, build extra companies and you're, you, you will maybe make that financial goal. I did that. Right. Sure. But then you hit 40 and things change. Okay. 40, you start to look back on your last, you know, 10 years and you go, was it all worth it? And sometimes the answer is yes. Sometimes the answer is no. But when you start realizing like things that you missed and things like your, your kids games and like being gone, like, you know, two weeks at a time on business trips and stuff like that, yeah, I had to make those sacrifices to be able to financial situation that I'm in now. And I don't have the regrets in that regard, but I do have the regrets in the family regard, you know, leaving mm -hmm. my, my wife and my son and being gone for sometimes 30 days. I was working offshore wow. international. Yeah. Like I'm gone. Like I was gone so often that some of my friends would think I was some international spy. Like, you're like, where you been? Like, you've been off the radar. You're not on the internet. Like there was no internet where I was, you know? Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you definitely look back and, you know, you have to ask yourself, like, you know, was it worth it? Some aspects, yes. Some aspects, no. Mm -hmm. Could you have maybe made a little bit more free time to give back and earn less? I think the answer is yes. Also in that regard, I would have definitely taken a pay cut to have an extra day off of work, right? Some of you may listen to this, you're watching this. You may, you may go, Hey, if I could take a 20% pay cut, would I take every Friday off? Like, you know, like you're taking one day out of five. Like, I think a lot right? of people would. I think a lot of people would definitely take a 20% pay cut to have a three day weekend every, every week. single weekend. Yeah. 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 So I'm trying to play with it as a business owner too. I'm like trying to pick one day a week where I don't work in the week. It hasn't, it's got to be a Monday or a Friday. That way you, you get your days, you know, you, you can get yeah, yeah. mini trips, little, little mini trips. Like we like to do. That's a good point. Trips. Yeah. I've been trying to do it on like a Tuesday or a Thursday because I have standing meetings on Mondays and Fridays. Mm -hmm. So maybe I'll just switch those standing meetings and I'll make it work. Um, I've done it once or twice. And it's been nice, even though it's in the middle of the week. Uh, yeah. But the reason I asked that is because you, you mentioned how, like when you're doing things that like fill you up, and they, you know, give you energy and they, they, cause you know what, when I'm working on my business, some days I can work 16 hours, go to bed pretty much wide awake, you know, it's because I'm so energized from everything I got done and been doing all day long and then wake up in the morning and feel electric, elect, electrified as soon as I wake up and my yep. feet hit the floor because I'm yep. so excited to get back to it. But if I'm working 16 hour days, that means I'm not spending time with I have a, I have a one-year-old son and, and a five-year-old daughter. Like these are important ages to me. Oh yeah. You know? Um, and I can get a lot more done working an extra eight hours a day, you know? Um, and I still feel happy and good, but then I'm like, that's, that can't be worth it. Yeah. The one-year-old will definitely not remember that stuff, but the five-year-old will. Yeah. But you know what? I remember all the things that I did with my daughter when she was his age. And I mm -hmm. loved every bit of it because I was yep. working from five to 10 o'clock at night waiting tables, mm -hmm. but I'd spend all day with her. And that was like the best thing in the world. Yeah. I wouldn't trade so, that for anything. So your goal would be, you know, finding that extra time freedom, carving that out and doing more of that to what fulfills you, but don't backfill the free time with more work, you know? Mm, definitely. Oh man. Good talk, man. <laughs> this is good. Um, so I, I would like to dig in, like, who do you, who's like the, I know you mentioned like one-on-one -on -one clients. So do you help 
just anyone out? Like, do you have stuff that can help people out that um, content and free stuff, books, low ticket stuff that people could, could get access to? Yeah, I would say the, the easiest way to gain information with no cost is really just the podcast. 365 Driven is the name. We're 250 episodes in. It's a top 1% ranked entrepreneurship nice. show. And I've had a lot of the big names. I mean, my mentors are Ed Milet and Andy Frizzella, and they've both been on the show a couple of times. And Oh, sweet. And so that that's the easiest way for me because I, I like to interview interesting people just like you do and get some good information. And it's not always the famous people. I would give some advice to people on that. It's like when you're listening to shows or YouTube videos, don't always think that you got to watch the famous people because I know people that are highly successful that don't have social medias, but if you can get them onto a microphone and they share their actual insights or their tactics, like you're going to learn a lot more Brilliant. from those episodes than from people who have really polished answers who have done the same thing a thousand times. Like they're, you know, I love celebrities and influencer stuff. And I get grouped into that as well, but you get a lot more heartfelt answers, a lot more tactical things from people who are not just speaking in sound bites. Right. Yep. And you, you hear, if you listen to them enough, you hear the same thing over and over and over again, yeah. because they have it all polished up and everything too, for sure. Yeah. Um, definitely. Some of it is good nuggets. Um, speaking of which, with what we were talking about before, I think, I don't know if it's Alex Ramosi's quote, but he, he definitely references it if it's someone else's, um, that when you're 20, like, it was like when I was 20, all I wanted to be was a millionaire. Right. Mm -hmm. And now that I'm 40 and I am a millionaire, all I want to be is 20. Yeah. I've actually seen that somewhere too. I don't know if that was his quote or not, but I, yeah, I, I agree with that. Yeah. Right. Yeah, for sure. But um, they can connect with you on the, the podcast. Probably the best thing. It's free, easy to listen to. That's a, that's a podcast and books have been like my highest ROI. Yeah. On anything. I replaced music. You're a music guy and you probably replaced music. I, I don't listen. Isn't to that crazy? Music. I did. I did. Yeah. I love music, but I do too. I, anytime I'm at the gym or I'm driving or anytime I have alone time. The, the gym is the only place now that I'll, yeah. I'll do the, I'll do music, but at driving cleaning the house anytime you can have listening things you know i that, that's the best thing about audiobooks and podcasts i can learn and yeah to me going to the gym i can still hear the music in the gym in the background right mm. but i still have my earbuds in listening to books or, or podcasts so I, I say that's my learn and burn sessions <laughs> cool um i'm uh i'm gonna dig into the kind of like the final three questions that i, I always ask um awesome one was pretty simple. Is that we're on the topic. What's the what's one book everyone should read? How to Win Friends and Influence Other People, Carnegie. Yeah, that's a good one. I keep going back to that one. That's one I've read. Like, dude, they oh, should they should have that as a, a freshman high school curriculum book. That that book everybody should read. It's everyone been out read. long enough. I mean, it was written like the nineteen forties or fifties or something. Yeah, it's good. It's I mean. So many good lessons. I like it's it's told in stories, which is brilliant, um, and it's super short, like tiny little tiny little book. Yeah, go read it. Go read it like three times, especially those of you who are single back and struggling. Back. You're, you're struggling. You're maybe you're struggling with your single life and, and dating. Like definitely, if you're not having a lot of friends that are actually worth the crap, go read that book. It will mm. teach you how to communicate, and you will become the interesting person in every circle. Mm. I also want to point out that I didn't read the book, that book, because of its title for the longest time. It's a goofy title. Because I was like, you're like, I got I friends. Win. Like, I'm not trying to win friends. I like, have friends. I don't, what do I need to influence people? Like ego, ego will keep you from reading a lot of good books. And, and it's funny, you know, and another book that the title like turned me off for probably a year, even though everybody was raving about this book, was The Five Second Rule by Mel Robbins. Oh, that's a good, I've heard it on so many podcasts and I haven't read the book. You, you should go read it, but see the title when I think like five second rule, like what the hell am I going to learn? And for five seconds, like this is not going to do anything. This is dumb. Like this has got to be some woo woo, wishy washy crap. Right. And yeah. so enough people kept recommending. I was like, you oh, know, fine. I'll just get the audio book because Mel's awesome on audio. She just talks trash and it's funny. She's funny. Yeah. So the book itself, like it's in my top 10 book list now. I was like, huh. oh crap. Like I actually learned some things that I've actually used and tactically and saw results from. So mm -hmm. yeah, the five second rule actually does work. I've, yeah. I've used it. It's um, 
just for those listening, because so you're like, what the hell is a five second rule? It's like, um, like let's say you're laying in bed in the morning, alarm went off, but you're not getting up yet. Mm-hmm. Like you, you give yourself the a countdown, like like you're uh, counting down for a blast off of like a spaceship. You know, mm-hmm. five, four, three, two, one, pop out of bed, go oh. do that thing that you weren't feeling or feeling it up works to like that. And and she explains the psychological reasons. There, it's not just fluff. It actually there's there's some good science behind it. She did the research. Yeah. And another the way I use it, not as much anymore, but when I was a little bit more introverted because I still consider myself an introvert right I would be at these maybe business seminars or you know things like that maybe you see somebody that you admire that you you see they're like right there and you can go introduce yourself but you're like oh, I don't want to bother them or you know I don't want to be like the fanboy or whatever like whatever your negative self-talk is in that moment but you go you know I'd really love to meet that person so you just do the countdown five four three two one and you walk up and introduce yourself so yeah. again like that is a game changer, dude. Like when you can like make yourself go do things without being focused on any negative self-talk in that moment, you will actually do things. Mm-hmm. I end up making myself do it before I hit one. Cause if I hit one, I can talk myself out of it. <laughs> and I, I don't know why, but like, like as soon as I hit one, I'm like, yeah, I didn't do it. I keep, you're just more efficient, man. You got the one second rule. Yeah. Then I go like five, four, three, just jump, you know? No. Cause, cause I'm not good at it. Whatever my psychological state isn't the same as everyone else but i just like start uh i'll end up staying in bed that extra 30 seconds or whatever and try and do it three more times and like, why that work? <laughs> well now no. you're snoosing the five second rule that's yeah not, i'm snoosing the, the five second rule that's no. not good don't do that like yeah, force yourself um say it with a little bit more vigor mm-hmm. so what uh if you can go back in time uh and you get to talk to yourself mm-hmm. right uh, you can go back to any age. And then when you're back at that age, you pop up as yourself now and you can say three sentences to yourself and then you disappear. What are, what age would you go back to? And what are the three sentences that you would say? Uh, and then you can, you can, I let the guests choose if they want to ex- expand on yeah. why. I would say the first age I would go back to is 15. And I would tell myself at 15 to learn not to care about what other people think about you. Because a lot of the things that we don't do as adults is because we are rooted in insecurities or fears that have been created in our childhood, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I grew up, I'm a half Japanese. I grew up in a town that was predominantly run by a bunch of people that were former World War II type era people who did not like Japanese people. So you can imagine like the authorities, the teachers, the police, like, these people knew who my mother was and it was a small town and I got treated that way. Right. So had I learned at that early age to not worry about what other people think, because I was going to figure things out on my own. Like that's a, that's a strength thing. Like I talk about mental freedom. Mental freedom is the ability to recognize criticism and naysaying and haters and things like that. The things I had to deal with now, but understanding that it's more about them than you, like right? throwing negative criticism or, hating on you, especially when your intentions are pure and you're doing things for a good reason. That's more about their insecurities trying to project on you. So understand that what they think doesn't matter. Like you're going to, you need to go do that. And like, if you want to build a show or write a book or get on stages or find the confidence to get on video, it always goes back to, you know, getting over yourself, you know, and that's, that's a, that's a hard thing to do. A lot of people never achieve that in their entire lives. It, for me, I had stage fright. I didn't like being on camera. I didn't like being on microphones. I didn't like being on stages. I was the MVP behind the background. And how do you get over that? I would say that at probably age 20, I would give myself that advice. Go hire a public speaking coach, go join Toastmasters, go become a, a more effective communicator, gain the confidence to be able to do the things that I do now. I mean, I didn't start doing that until I was in my 40s. I wish I would have started in my 20s. I, I, I was successful, but I know that I could have greatly accelerated the results had I just had the ability to just stand up and be able to speak with emotion and energy and had the conviction and the storytelling skills, right? So, so uh, don't worry about what people think of you, right? Yeah. Become a better communicator. Become a better communicator and go hire um, um a public speaking coach at age 20 and yeah. what's the, the third sentence you think you'd go with? I would say the third one would be to understand that living your best life is not about making your peak income. 
because I know a lot of people, they were what you would call rich who are very unhappy, but at some point earlier in their life, they were happier. They're much happier for different reasons. And so money doesn't buy happiness. I definitely think that you should go pursue money and be financial free, but don't think that it's going to improve your life just because you're stacking revenue or getting a higher EBITDA and these different things. Like if you start working 16 hours a day versus eight to go double your income, is that really worth the trade-off? It's probably not, right? So assess your stress, your happiness, your fulfillment, make sure those boxes are checked and then go earn as much as you can if you can keep those intact, right? Don't ever sacrifice things like that. So, you know, happiness is not, in, it has nothing to do with commas, you know? Mm. If you're miserable now and you're broke, you're probably gonna be miserable when you have money because you haven't done the internal work to figure out what makes you happy. So that's what I would learn. I always thought that if I could earn more money, I would be accepted by more people who are doing more things and then I had to prove myself and, you know, I was immature and you know, like these different things. It's just, you look back now and it's like, I can see people doing that now. And I realize that they're just, they haven't had money very long. Like I, they're new to money because they're still behaving the way I used to do it when I was new to money. But when you're 10, 15, 20 years into having money, you realize like, I really was kind of a douchebag at some point. I was really kind of insecure and I was showing 10 cars in my driveway and stuff like that. I just, I realized that I was trying to get validation to feel like I belonged at some you know, imaginary table that this is the way to do it. But now I just don't care about that stuff. I mm. really don't. You think people have to go through that? Or? Yes. I think it's easy to, because people will hear what I'm saying. Like, well, it's easy for you to say, because you, you've had money and you're, you're rich. Like, yeah, but I'm trying to teach you like what to expect. Like, that's what I'm trying yeah, to Yeah, it's not more, it's not, not so, what I'm trying to get at. Is it's not really advice. It's just being aware. Yes. Of that. Cause like, it's not, I don't know. I'm starting to accumulate a little bit of money and yeah. buy, buy the things that make you happy. I'm, I'm saying like, Hey, I love materialistic shit. Like if you like watches, go buy that fancy watch. You've been wanting. you want a fancy car, go buy that. If it makes you happy, but don't ever, ever, ever buy something to try to please other people. Mm. You know, but, yeah. uh, like I love cars. Like, and some people will say, Oh, Tony, how come you haven't bought a Lamborghini yet? I was like, I can go buy a Lamborghini if I want. I've got several cars that cost that same amount. I can go buy one, but that's not what I like. No. You I, don't like, like I like American cars. I like Dodge Pipers. I like pro touring muscle cars. I like my TRX. I like American cars. Mm -hmm. So I buy what I like. I don't care what you like. Right. Right. That's cool. What's your favorite car that you own now? This is one of the three questions that I'm interested in. No, that's easy. That's my 1969 Camaro. Ooh. Um, you got a picture of it? Could you send it to me? I'll toss it up in the podcast. Yeah, yeah, I could. Uh, it's been on the cover of magazines, and uh, I actually built the car myself. I've got a full size shop in my back of my property, and I built the entire car. And, you know, if you were to duplicate it, it's probably close to $300,000 to build a car at that level. So, you know, there's my Lamborghini, but it just looks like a Camaro, and I like Camaros better than Lamborghinis. Yeah, I uh, I'm sure there's nowhere like anything that you have. But um, when, <laughs> I was pretty excited when I went to um, Arizona and they Enterprise up upgraded me to a Camaro. It was the first time I drove one. I was like, oh, that's pretty sweet. They're man. fun. Yeah, I yeah, still love yeah. those cars. My wife wants me to go buy another one, like just a daily drive for her. You know? Yeah, they're fun for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's like tough not. You're a car guy. You find it like tough not to get in trouble. Like I'm like sometimes when. No. You, I mean, when they have that power, you feel like you, I mean, you, you got to use it sometimes. Well, you use it at the track. I mean, one of my Vipers has 1200 horsepower and you know, people are like, how do you drive that? It's like, well, if you only give it half throttle, it's only 600 horsepower. <laughs> like you well, just drive it like a normal car. Like you, you don't have to floor it everywhere you go. I mean, you just, it's all controlled by the throttle, right? So, you know, a thousand horsepower car, 10% throttle is a hundred horsepower. So you know, not that perfectly linear, but you know what I mean? That's like, just no, the, no, I people are always shocked by that. It's like, I mean, even a Tesla, like the Tesla plaid, if you put that on a dyno, they're actually making about 1100 horsepower. Wow. But people are driving them around, like going to the grocery store and like they behave like a normal car until you floor it. And then it's fast. They're super fast. I drove one, mm. but unless you were to floor it, you would never know. It would just behave like a normal car. Yeah. <laughs> it's cool. Um, I, yeah, I was just like, I just wanted to drive 
like an asshole on the, <laughs> I'm not, as soon as I got in the Camaro, you know? I'm, I, I'm actually very calm and like, I'm never in a hurry on the highway. I, I mean, maybe when I was in my twenties, I probably behaved a little silly because we always do, but yeah. you know, I actually prefer getting on the road course or on the drag strip and, and challenging my abilities as a driver and actually maximizing performance out there where I actually have times and that like lap awesome. times. And, you know, so I'm okay with, not driving like that in the public anymore. I, I've done it before. I'm, I'm not saying I'm an angel, right? But overall, it's like 95% of the time I'm on the road. I'm just cruising and I don't really care about what's going on out there. I just kind of just take my time and I don't I don't like being in a hurry. I just leave on time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm the same way. Same way. I'm just like when I got in the Camaro, I was like, I'll drive this a little faster today. Yeah. You why know? not? I, I drive it, dude. I drive a Toyota RAV4 right now, you know? Like, yeah. I mean, so like, experience, you got to experience it. I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm not yeah. saying not to do that, but it's mm-hmm. when it's available to you every day, you would drive it like a normal car. That's, it, that's right. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. Um, cool. I'll get to my last question. What What's the biggest regret that you have in your life? Biggest regret, man. Hmm. I think, you know, going back to those three questions that I, I kind of answered about early in my life, I think if you just had that awareness, you know, and you know, Gary Vee and some of these other members, we talk about awareness, like people are like, what is that? Awareness is that split second that exists between something that is a stimulus versus your reaction or your response, right? So you have the stimulus, which could be a news headline or something you see or someone's words, like something that creates a reaction. Your awareness is that, yeah, awareness closer. is that sliver of microseconds in between the stimulus to the reaction. And when you see people have like road rage and like freak out or lose composure, or they're just losing emotional control or they're reacting or saying words that they can't take back. It's because they lack awareness. And, and as we age and gain wisdom, we start to realize that that wasn't the best reaction. That wasn't the best way I should have handled that because I lacked awareness. But now when you work with a coach or you work with a, you know, someone that can be external and watching these things that you're doing, they're going to raise your awareness. They're going to say, Hey, when I say that your face did that, why is that? And you're like, Oh crap. I didn't even know my face did that. Mm. And so what they've done is they've instilled a little bit more awareness in between the stimulus and the reaction. And as we get older, we start to realize like awareness starts to grow like ex- exponentially, I would say. Like when I was young, I had very little awareness. You start getting your 30s, some awareness, 40s, when you're starting thinking about legacy and mortality and things like that, more later in my 40s, I'm almost 50. Like I said, my awareness is continuing to grow. So that time between stimulus to reaction has gotten bigger now where I can assess the way I should respond and the way I should react and maintain emotional control which I wish I'd have known that. I, so the regret to me is like not having that at an earlier age mm. in all aspects, in all aspects. Right, right. Awesome, man. Well, um, where, where does everyone go follow you? Easiest thing is my website has everything that you need to find. My book, podcasts, all the social media channels is 365driven.com. Awesome. Nice and simple. I really, really appreciate you taking time to, to come on the podcast today. Uh, I know this has got to be helpful for, for someone out there. Speaking of which, if you are listening, I, like, I really don't want to sell you guys anything on this podcast ever. Um, so I'd love for you to share this out, leave a review so we can get more awesome people like Tony on here. Um, it, it just means the world to me, honestly, that you're even listening and that you've made it this far through the episode. Like, really, really, really means more to me than you can imagine. Um, and yeah, I'd love for you to share it out with people that you, that you care about and think get some some use out of it and and uh, go follow follow Tony. Tell me like the episode and uh, and welcome to come back on because uh, this is great, man. Thank you so much again. Hey, thanks for having me on. And yeah, I definitely want to hear from you guys. If you're listening, and you got something from the front of this. Don't don't be afraid to reach out. People do like to hear from you for sure. Yeah, do the five second rule. There you go. There That's you it. go. All right, guys. Until next time. Peace.